To say that my vintage story videos performed well for this channel would be a major understatement. So it is only natural that after I took some time off to play and review Valheim, I wanted to make another vintage story video for all you lovely folks. And while I took the path of least resistance for my first 100 days video by settling in the south and enjoying good weather all year round, I did the exact opposite for this challenge. Enter the Arctic Challenge. That is right, I'm going to create a world where the Arctic region extends for thousands and thousands and thousands of blocks. Then I'm going to teleport myself to the North Pole and try to survive in this sterile, cold and incredibly dangerous environment. To go even further, I am not going to use primitive survival mod like the recent series I have watched by a creator I shall not name. <coughs> Private Lime. Great series by the way. I'm doing this challenge purely vanilla style. I'm still using a few quality of life mods, but they in no shape or form modify how this challenge plays out. Final disclaimer, if you think about doing this challenge, just don't. What you will see in this video is a result of tinkering for a dozen of hours with different classes, figuring out optimal strategies, and well, starting over. This was by all means not my first attempt. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. For the world settings, I set the world climate to cold. This setting does nothing if you're planning to teleport to the North Pole like I did, but if you want the exact same seed configuration as mine, you must change this or yours will be drastically different. The only other seed option that I changed was setting the polar distance to 800k. This ensures that your polar region will extend for many thousands of blocks, giving you ample space to move around without transitioning to a warmer region. For seed name, type in frozen and make sure to capitalize the F. I do believe seed names are case sensitive. For non-seed related settings, I set my life count to 1. This is hardcore after all. Then I enable underground farming, keep watching to see why. I set the sapling growth speed to normal. Growing saplings is integral to the arctic survival and default speed is way too slow. And finally, I disable class specific recipes. I prefer to have an option to craft anything. One more thing to point out. Here is how I set up my year. Unfortunately, there is no elegant way to make 12 months work within 100 days. This is the way I chose to do it to have a round year. For the character class worthy of a polar start, there are only two options, Malefactor and Hunter. I found Malefactor to be the easiest overall due to the higher loot from the vessels, which is the only way to acquire certain materials at the poles. Once you have your class picked, you can teleport yourself to the above coordinates found through trial and error. This happens to be exactly 90 degrees latitude, which is of course the North Pole. Let's have a quick conversation about what needs to transpire to survive the first day. This challenge has a large degree of randomness, so don't be surprised if things don't go your way on your first attempt. Your first task is to find some ruins and by extension some cracked vessels. The two type of vessels you are looking for are arctic supply and forage. Both can potentially drop dry grass, which you absolutely need right away, or you will freeze and starve to death on the first day. It is also nice if it drops you some sticks and some type of stone to craft tools, but both can be acquired in the wild unlike dry grass. Your next task is to find some trees. Luckily, trees are not too rare at the poles, although they are not common either. It can really bite you in the ass if there are none nearby. Next, you need to craft an axe, chop down the nearest tree and start a campfire with your dry grass to warm up. If you have failed to do that, you will start taking cold damage by this time. Being warm is just the first step to staying alive in the arctic. You will also need to eat. So it is time to show off your spear throwing skills. You've been uh, practicing those, right? Once you manage to shake off the rust and kill your first rabbit, nap yourself a knife and process your prey. You will quickly discover that these small animals do not provide you with a lot of food. Rabbits typically just drop one piece of meat, but at least it's red meat, unlike foxes who drop bush meat, which is way worse. And sometimes they drop, well, nothing. Most of your early days will be filled with hunting as you barely stay afloat in terms of sustenance and you will not sustain on small animals alone, that's a guarantee. Sooner or later you will need to hunt the big game. That's right, to survive in the arctic you will need to hunt bears. Next follows the free bear hunting guide from yours truly. Dig a 1x2 hole, now shove a spear up the bear's butt, preferably from range. Hop into your hidey hole and now you can safely poke the bear. Do note that bears have extremely unpredictable AI and you will need to bunny hop to keep their attention. Be warned though, they can absolutely hit you mid jump when you do that. They will also randomly lose all interest in you and run away, so you will need to move your hole up. This method does work, although it's tedious and slow. I had good success with it before discovering another much faster way to do this. 
Malefactor has reduced animal seeking range as one of his class perks, and it's one of the more unique perks in the game. It allows you to essentially outrange the bear entirely. It will not react to spear damage at all. A word of warning though, you must do this precisely. You can misjudge the distance quite easily, and once the bear decides to charge you, it will chase you to the ends of the earth. I suggest practicing for a while before you commit to doing this. Just remember, better safe than sorry. Just because you killed a single bear does not mean you can afford to stop hunting. Eventually, you will need to make another campfire to warm up and cook all the meat you gathered. It does take a while to cook, but it should be enough to get you through the first day. And just like that, you will be done with day one. Once I got my hunger bar under control, it was time to set out exploring for more ruins. I was lucky with a farming vessel dropping me three cattail baskets, and combined with another linen sack that dropped previously, my inventory space was looking good. Meanwhile, I was struggling to find anything to hunt in the valley. I knew that one way to encounter more animals was to climb onto a ridge. That entailed a little bit of climbing and building a pillar rest of the way. These climbs are treacherous, and I was working hard not to slip. Arctic ridges seem to contain a lot more animals, but nothing else. No trees, no ruins, no nothing. It was also significantly colder up here. However, it did give me a good vantage point to scout for points of interest. Once I spotted a cluster of ruins, I descended to check them out. One of the ruins contained a rare chest with some new drip in it. The drip was fine, but I was mostly looking for medium fertility soil and dry grass. Everything else was extra, with the occasional healing poultice being one of the nicer finds. I found a rune with no obvious chest anywhere, which meant it was worth digging around for one. Next, I spotted a building materials trader. Traders would play a vital role down the line, but for now, they were useless. Another rune provided me with a copper pickaxe, and while my inventory space was extremely tight, a copper pickaxe was worth picking up. Heading south, I found a large ruin containing a chest that dropped me blue clay. Another important development. There are no natural sources of clay this far north, and it will absolutely prevent you from progressing technologically. Even further south, the view opened up to a big valley with several ruins in sight. I stopped by the first set of ruins to start a campfire. The cracked vessel dropped cabbage seeds, which weren't of use to me yet. I cooked a few pieces of bushmeat on the campfire and ate them promptly. There was another trade wagon close by, by my impromptu camp. This time around, it was a treasure hunter, a pretty solid trader to have nearby. A treasure hunter was not going to solve my hunger though, it was time to hunt. I ran around and all I could find was a frozen brown bear. I put him down, quickly skinned him and built a campfire to cook. Here I found out that Snowfall puts out a fire, so I had to cover it up with some blocks. While waiting for the bushmeat to cook, I decided to make a pan, and pan nearby sand in hopes of scoring a bronze spear. The odds were stacked against me though. Once my belly was reasonably full of cooked bushmeat, it was time to move on. I found loose flint laying around, which was a nice find. I would be using stone tools for a good while. Yet another ruin needed a bit of excavation to find a chest. It paid off in spades by dropping a full stack of blue clay. Next, I found a rare food vessel, which upon breaking dropped me a little spelled grain. Too bad I had nothing to cook with. This was a good time to fix that issue. I decided to put blue clay that dropped earlier to good use. I formed a cooking pot and three bowls, which I stuck into a pit kiln and fired that sucker up. Of course, I couldn't afford to wait all day for this process to finish because I was already starving. So I set my sights on yet another brown bear. This would be my life for a long time to come, living paycheck to paycheck. Paycheck being a bear in this analogy. By the time I killed the bear and made a campfire, I lost a lot of health due to starvation. So I healed with the poultice found in the runes and ate some bear fat to string myself along while the bushmeat cooked. Once I was up and running, I decided to climb a nearby ridge to cross into a neighboring valley. On top of the ridge, I took an opportunity to do some hunting. The hunting almost went badly when a brown bear decided I was closer than it would have liked. Luckily, he did eventually lose interest in me. I didn't lose interest in him, however. I came back and took my petty revenge for the jump scare. Once I processed the bear, I descended into the valley navigating the treacherous slopes. I hunted any small game I ran into down here. Every bit of food was vital at this stage. I found another rune and had to stop for a campfire session as I was starving yet again. While the food was cooking, I took an opportunity to break a nearby vessel which dropped spelled seeds. 
Eventually, I would have to transition to farming one way or another, and getting a seed collection going was the first step. Once I replenished my hunger, I got going over another small ridge into a valley full of larches, which was a welcomed sight. I would need a lot of this wood eventually. I came upon a very large ruin almost immediately. These large ruins were strictly worse than the smaller ones. It took too much digging to get to the vessels. Next, I stumbled upon a pine tree with some mushrooms. Who knew mushrooms grew this far north? Of course, with such a lovely name as a funeral bell, I knew they were not going to nourish me. There were a decent amount of foxes running around these large forests, so I took every shot I saw. I found an artisan trader, but house decorations were very low on the giant list of current concerns. I stumbled upon a small rune that took some digging out to get to the seed cache, with the reward being a small amount of soybean seeds. A ruin right behind was a big winner for me, dropping intact vessels due to the malefactor perk with forage and food supplies. But that's not all, there was also an extra seed cache, which dropped intact somehow as well. 3 for 3 baby. I decided to take these vessels as is without breaking them for now. Afterwards, I climbed a nearby ridge by building an ice pillar and made a campfire on top to cook some bush meat. It was that time again. Once I was fully nourished, it was time to press forward. I crossed the ridge back to the ruin where I fired a cooking pot and lo and behold it was fully done. Another small ruin provided a few rusty gears. I already had a few gears from breaking various vessels scattered around, so I promptly traded 8 gears to a treasure hunter for another seed vessel. I was extremely tired of having to hunt every second of my existence. It was time to start fixing that, and seeds were the answer. I found a flat area covered in pines, and decided it was time to lay down some roots. I started a campfire, and for the first time loaded a cooking pot with spell grain to make porridge. This food was necessary. I was about to undertake my first major project. Before I got going though, I needed to acquire some fat for a candle. I ate all the fat just to stay afloat and currently had none. Climbing a ridge and going after a polar bear was the easiest way to get there. Now that I had fat, I returned to my new place of habitation and crafted an oil lamp. Then I dove into icy water ready to dig out all the way to the mantle. My plan was to farm underground. Main reason to do that is that it offers close to a 20 degree difference between surface temperatures and temperatures close to the mantle. Essentially, making it into a supercharged greenhouse that would extend my farming capabilities late into the year. I wanted to avoid using ladders since that would require a lot of materials. Utilizing a water column for vertical transportation seemed like a better play. While digging down, I had to make a few pit stops to prevent drowning by digging sideways. Right at the end of my tunnel, I managed to find iron. This was a fun development. Searching for iron can be an insane hassle, but here it was, ready to be dug out. Too bad I was nowhere near the technology necessary to do that. Once I made it to the mantle, I started digging out tunnels radiating from the central point. I was planning to use the water column as an irrigation method since I didn't have a bucket yet. Once I had a tunnel in each cardinal direction, I tilled all the soil in preparation for planting. When that was done, I made my way up and cracked the seed vessel I was saving. I also made a campfire and prepared a set of torches to light my grow up. I dove back down into the cold water. Going down was a relatively fast process and going up was equivalent to a ladder in terms of speed. It was time to plant the seeds. I had a small stack of spelt and soybean seeds and I planted them all. I placed a couple of torches around, hoping that it would be enough light to grow plants. Torches are not ideal. They don't provide a ton of light and burn out in 48 hours when planted, but this was the best I could do for now. There is however a trick with torches. If you break them and place them back, the 48 hour timer resets. It is tedious, but with a limited supply of dry grass for torches, that's the only way out. Next, it was time to make some base improvements. I went back up and proceeded to craft a couple of reed chests. This additional storage was a godsend and was going to be the only source of extra storage for a while. I broke the leaves of nearby pines by hand, trying to score as many pine seeds as possible before chopping them all down. Then I planted the pine seedlings in nearby sand because wood was hard to come by in the arctic. I decided to place down all the extra soil in hopes of sprouting grass on it. I also clay formed a watering can and fired it up in a pit kiln. I would be going down to replace torches in my grow up rather frequently, so I figured might as well water the plants while I'm down there to give them an extra boost. 
All of this work made me very hungry, and I had to make a quick run to snag another polar bear. Fortunately, I was getting very confident in tackling them by now. After taking two bears down, I had to make a quick campfire in a nearby ruin to cook. I was already taking starvation damage. Unfortunately, cooking bushmeat was a lengthy and wood-intensive process, another reason that farming was so crucial to my future success. Speaking of farming, I wanted to squeeze out as much out of the short growing season as possible and that meant getting fertilizer. So I found the first deep looking cave and there descending down to look around. To my surprise, there was saltpeter on the walls of this exact cave, just what doctor ordered. Unfortunately, this meant that I ran into the first drifters trying to end my run. You might have noticed that this was my first encounter with the drifters. Fun fact, they cannot spawn during the day and the day was endless at the North Pole. Of course, that meant that in the back half of the year, there would only be night. As soon as I made it back, I dove down to my grow up to apply saltpeter on every farm block. I also watered my garden. I didn't know how much that would help, but any little bit would count in the end. There ain't no rest with the wicked though, and I had to quickly transition to hunting. This time around, I took my time to bag more than just one bear. I was tired of constantly running out of food in the middle of another task. While on the ridge, I spotted another rune and came back down to check it out. This one was amazing. Three vessels and a rare chest. However, first I needed to start cooking up some bushmeat in the campfire. The first vessel rewarded me with dry grass. Second had even more dry grass and four healing poultices. And the third one had more dry grass and cattails. The rare chest didn't have anything notable besides a few gears and cloth pants. Once my hunger was restored, I did not want to wait around for all the bushmeat to cook. I figured I would do it at base instead. On the way back, I took an opportunity to bag even more bears. I took not one, not two, but three more bears. By the end, I had a whole stack of uncooked bushmeat and eight pieces of fat. This would last me for a little while. I proceeded to walk back to the base with the biggest food hole yet. I dove down to the farming operation and proceeded to water it and refresh the torches. With the grow up taken care of and with food for days, it was time to transition to a copper age. So I used most of the blue clay collected from the ruins to clay form a pickaxe mold, a hammer mold, a couple of ingot molds and an anvil mold, all necessary for technological progression. Next, I fired them up in their respective pit kilns. Unfortunately, I forgot all about the crucible, so I clay formed that along with three balls and placed them into another pit. Too bad I miscalculated and ran out of dry grass to do another firing. The soil I placed down earlier has not grown any grass. After doing some testing, I realized that grass can only grow on tilled soil in the Arctic for some unknown reason. So I moved the soil downstairs to my underground farm and tilled it, hoping that eventually it would produce something. I was not going to wait for the grass to grow though. It was time to find some ruins in hopes of scoring more dry grass. So I climbed the ridge once again and proceeded to a valley I have yet to explore. And sure enough, there was a ruin unfortunately guarded by a brown bear. I carefully walked around him and broke the vessel. To my elation, there was dry grass in the vessel. Now that I had dry grass and could fire the crucible, it was time to head home. While on the ridge, I took an opportunity to snag a few foxes. Every bit of food counted. At base, I threw the bushmeat on the campfire and fired up the crucible in the pit kiln. Of course, I immediately proceeded to water the plants downstairs. The firing of my first batch of clay was complete, but I needed a few more things before I could transition to copper. I ran around my valley and collected surface brown coal and copper bits so I could smelt my first copper hammer and another copper pickaxe. I also collected some cobblestone from ruins nearby. I used said cobblestone to expand my base area, which was rapidly shrinking due to ice melt. Perhaps building on a formerly frozen lake was a mistake. After stopping by to water the plants, I discovered my first piece of grass. The tilled farmland was indeed the play. My crucible was also done cooking, so I placed it in a campfire, added brown coal and copper, and poured my first copper items into the molds. Once the molten copper had time to cool off, I crafted the necessary tools to start excavating copper deposits. There was no shortage of copper deposits all over the valleys. They were extremely easy to spot in the white of the Arctic. One such deposit happened to be right under my base. 
I would have loved for the bushmeat stack to last a while longer, but it sure didn't. So I had to interrupt my copper progression to hunt more bears. I made sure to return with plenty of bushmeat. Once I had my food requirements met, I proceeded to dig out even more copper and then I hit up a brown coal deposit nearby. Everything was conveniently close to my base. And just like that, I had enough copper and coal to smelt a whole anvil, a couple of copper ingots and another copper pickaxe. It was time to craft a forge, so I sacrificed some of the cobblestone floor to make one. Once the anvil cooled off, I slapped it on the ground. I felt pretty goddamn accomplished at this moment. It took a lot of hard work to get here. Next, I heated up a couple of copper ingots and proceeded to make a saw. I followed that up with a set of copper nails. You might guess where this is going. I made planks with the saw and combined them with the nails to craft four chests. This explosion of inventory was an orgasmic feeling. I quickly sorted and organized my wares into their respective chests. I didn't stop there. I heated up two more ingots and made a prospecting pick and an axe. I kept pouring more ingots as soon as the previous batch was cooled off. I had a lot of other tools to make still. Next, it was time to start prospecting. Copper was just the beginning. Obviously, finding iron was not going to be a problem, but finding metals to make bronze alloys still loomed heavily over my head. Without that, there would not be any iron processing taking place. There was nothing immediately promising around my area. As I traveled further, I encountered a weird sun glitch. The sun was vibrating violently with the shadows following the same dance. This was not a one-off. The North Pole did have a ton of weird lighting issues and bugs that I encountered over my playthrough. Probably because it was never designed for people to live in. Oh well. Next, I decided to hop back on the ridge to do a bit of hunting. Surprisingly, I only encountered a single bear on the ridge and instead foxes were out in full force. I was not going to complain too much and instead focused on hunting every last one. I hopped down from the ridge into the large forest to do some more prospecting, but I didn't find anything exciting. Since I was already down here, I decided to fill up my inventory with large wood. While at it, I also tried to collect some large seeds by breaking the leaves, but quickly learned that large seeds were exceedingly rare compared to the most trees. I'm not sure what the reasoning behind that is, but they were not sustainable. Once my inventory was filled up to the brim with large wood, I started my trek back. It felt like the summer was in full swing. It was surprisingly hot. I did not expect that out of the Arctic playthrough. As a consequence, it made navigating valleys a lot more difficult, since a lot of them happened to be frozen lakes originally. This was not evident until the snow melt. In fact, the lake around my base was now fully melted. Once I arrived back, I dove down to water the plants and to replace the torches. Unfortunately, it was starting to become evident that there was in fact not enough light to grow some of these plants. While the plants closest to the torches were growing, the ones a little farther away were still at the first stage. This of course was no bueno. Eventually, I had plans to replace all of the torches with lanterns, but I was still very far away from making that a reality. I dove down again and went overboard with placing torches everywhere. I needed this farm to start producing. Next, I decided to replace my flint spears with copper. So I got going by pouring more copper ingots and working them on an anvil. The need to hunt was not going away anytime soon, and while flint spears have decent damage, their durability is horrible. I crafted 6 copper spears total. And what do you know, I immediately put those copper spears to good use by hopping on the ridge and introducing polar bears to my new tech. I even managed to find a bear stuck in a cave. Easiest kill of my life. Meanwhile, I was busy prospecting, but the results were not promising. I returned to my base and hopped down to check on the plants. The addition of torches in the grow up solved my issues, as most plants were now progressing through their stages nicely. This operation would start returning dividends in spades soon enough. Afterwards, I went back to prospecting and it finally paid off. I hit a chunk with decent numbers of castorite, which translated to tin. They weren't the best, and I would have loved to prospect further east, but because the ridge was in the way, and the ridges are solid ice through and through, there was no chance to prospect further. So I decided to dig down and prospect the chunk to see what's up. I made a water column once again to help me go up and down the tunnel. While digging down, I would stop every 10 blocks and prospect to see if anything bites. Unfortunately, nothing was coming up in this chunk. I decided to dig horizontally going east at the optimal tin depth, while frequently checking for tin deposits via a node search. I made it all the way to the next chunk and prospected that as well. 
The tin amount didn't rise, but it also didn't fall. I had no better leads anyway, so I kept digging east. Eventually, I ran out of food, so I ran back up for a quick snack. It just so happened that my first temporal storm hit at this time. I did not want to have anything to do with the storm. The storm would not provide anything worth dying for. I dug out a small panic shelter and placed a bunch of rocks on the ground to block drifter spawns. By the way, I since learned that this doesn't actually block the spawns during a temporal storm. Most spawn restrictions are disabled. I would not advise doing what I did. After the storm, I went back to searching for tin. And lo and behold, I got a tin hit on the prospecting pick somewhere along the fifth chunk from the original spot. However, the game was trying to force me into a cave, and after avoiding it for a little while, I reluctantly entered the dark space. Luckily, there didn't seem to be anything threatening down here, and as a nod to my bravery, the game rewarded me with an aged wooden bed. A nice find indeed. I mined all the tin from the cave, grabbed the bed, and got out of there while the going was good. I had tin for days now, but my copper supplies were low, so I stopped by a few copper spots to refill. Now came the fun part, pouring a tin bronze anvil and a tin bronze pickaxe. That meant that iron was just around the corner. Another big development happened to be my first harvest. A couple of soybean plants hit their maturity and I promptly harvested them. This meant a first farm grown and home cooked meal. The days of hunting for my sustenance were officially over. I was psyched for this development. Hunting was taking up too much of my time. Once my tin bronze pickaxe cooled off, it was time for iron. This was a very easy task indeed. I already had a water elevator to take me down in a rapid fashion and plenty of exposed iron for the taking. Even better, the iron was of bountiful variety, which meant my iron needs were covered for the rest of the playthrough. Of course, I still needed charcoal to make my dreams a reality, so I dug out a large pit and filled it up to the brim with large wood. I lit it up and prayed for a better outcome compared to my last 100 days playthrough. If you watched it, you know what I'm talking about. While getting charcoal was an easy task, getting fire clay bricks to make bloomeries was not, which was a big problem. Nevertheless, I was hopeful that I had a solution in mind. The solution involved smelting tin bronze ingots and crafting a tin bronze saw and a tin bronze axe. I took these wares to the building materials trader to sell. He only wanted to buy a saw, so I sold it for profit. Regardless, I had a decent supply of rusty gears from various cracked vessels, and the trader did miss solid by carrying 5 stacks of fire clay, which was very lucky indeed. It was entirely possible I would not see this trade for months. I immediately ran back in excitement and made three bloomeries ASAP. My charcoal was done cooking with no issues, so I lured up the bloomeries with iron and charcoal and lit those suckers up. This meant I was officially in the iron age. Too bad this was the top of the progression ladder. Making steel was a no-go in the arctic due to lack of fire clay deposits. The amount of fire clay needed to progress to steel was not reasonably obtainable. There were plenty of other things to do on my list though. Next, I decided it was time to craft some lanterns. I was tired of having to constantly repair torches in my grow up. The limiting factor was candles. The only reasonable way to get candles involved ruins once again. Luckily, I marked all the ruins I ever visited for this exact reason. It was not a particularly exciting process. Most ruins required extensive digging, but a few were already dug out by me previously. A benefit of digging out the bony soil is that you would also encounter plenty of low fertility soil, which was prime material for grass proliferation. Meanwhile, I was also firmly in the farming age. I gathered close to a dozen soybean plants and planted the second generation to start growing. After I attended to the plants, I started panning the bony soil in hopes of scoring some candles. From the notable loot, I scored a golden necklace and a golden coronet, which I equipped immediately. I then pulled another golden necklace and a couple of lower books. All of this drip was potentially sellable to a luxury trader for a big profit, but for now, I simply equipped it to look fly. Unfortunately, I only managed to pan two candles from 35 pieces of bony soil, Bruh. which is a little under par and was the whole reason for the panning operation in the first place. Nevertheless, I produced a couple of copper plates and crafted a couple of lanterns. It was also time to start producing iron tools since my first batch of iron blooms was done cooking. 
I took some time to work the blooms into ingots and produce my first iron hammer and an iron pickaxe. Then I hopped down to the grow op to replace two torches with two lanterns. That meant two less torches to replace every cycle, a good start. On the way up, I stopped to mine a little more iron with my new shiny iron pickaxe. This allowed me to start a second batch of iron. This time around, I only had enough bricks for two bloomeries. I would need to buy more bricks soon. Following, I stopped by a brown coal deposit to mine even more brown coal because I was running out from all the smithing. Luckily, there was almost an infinite amount of brown coal in my area, which was saving me from using precious charcoal. Now that I had plenty of brown coal for my smithing needs, it was time to perform a full Iron Age transition. I crafted everything under the sun an axe, a shovel, a knife, and even some shears, along with a chisel and an extra pickaxe. Another batch of iron was done, but I didn't bother starting the next one. For one, I had plenty of iron for the time being, and my firebrick supply was mostly used up. I continued my smithing rampage by working on tin bronze tools for the future trades. Then I took a quick break to check on the farm and was rewarded with the first spelt harvest. I was now fully supported by the grow up and could finally afford to sprint everywhere. I decided to stop by the building materials trader, but he wasn't buying any of the tools, nor did he have any fire clay bricks. I figured it was time to explore the other valleys for more traders. The small valley to the northwest housed another building materials trader who bought a tin bronze axe and a tin bronze saw, and even had four stacks of fire clay bricks to boot, which I immediately purchased. Just around the corner from the trader was another rune with a seed vessel which dropped onion seeds. This would be the fourth type of seed I found so far if I didn't lose the cabbage seeds somewhere along the way. Variety is the spice of life. I would plant these in my subterranean garden. Next, I dug through the rune for the bony soil. Certainly, I needed all the candles I could get my hands on in preparation for permanent nights. I walked past a cave and noticed a bit of cobble sticking out. I checked it out and sure as hell there was a ruin there. It wasn't a particularly exciting one, just a dozen torches and a few rusty gears. But considering my ability to make torches was extremely limited, it was still something. I also took an opportunity to dig out some surface copper. While my tin supply was still rather healthy, the copper was running out on a daily basis. Since I was on this side of town, I took an opportunity to collect pine seeds with the new shears. The rest of the inventory was reserved for pine wood. Every ruin I spotted, I would dig completely out. I didn't care much for cracked vessels anymore. Bony soil was king. Down in the valley, I found a luxury trader, which was a cool development. There were a few big ticket items I could potentially sell for big profit down the road. With the inventory full of wood, bony soil, seeds, and other miscellaneous goodies, I made the trek back home. This trip ended up being very productive. At home, majority of the pine seeds had now sprouted, giving the area a cool vibe. I planted the rest of the seeds in my inventory to continue this trend. I wanted a forest full of pines by the end of this journey. With the rapid growth of my polar kingdom came storage limitations. So I crafted another set of copper nails to turn into four more chests. Next, I smithed an iron hoe and tilled more low fertility farmland that I got from excavating numerous runes. This strategy was seemingly paying off, with patches of grass starting to appear on the land. The underground farm continued to produce as well. It was summer and the getting was good. So good in fact that I needed to expand and renovate the underground farm to accommodate all the crops. Next, it was time to pan bony soil. So I put on a good TV show and got to work. I'm no rabbit. That remains to be seen. Somehow, I only managed to pull a single candle from about 30 pieces of soil. What the hell? However, panning bony soil did prove to be a highly effective way of getting flax twine. So good in fact that I had enough to craft three more linen sacks. Unfortunately, this would have to do for now. Upgrading to leather bags would not be possible. Following, I ran to the outer edge of the valley to collect whole granite blocks for a quern. It was used to grind bones into a fertilizer, which was good for the onions I found earlier. But it was that time of the month again, time to hide from a temporal storm. So I sat in my panic shelter playing and scheming for the future until it was all over. When it was over, I had a couple of drifters sitting in my trap, but they dropped me nothing. 
I resumed my day by making more tin bronze tools for trading. A building materials trader can buy saws, axes and hammers and since I had two of these traders it made sense to make a double set of each. Furthermore, the treasure hunter can trade for shovels, pickaxes and weapons so I made a set for him as well. Between the storm and very long smithing session I missed the timing on the torches at my farm. This is where the dozen torches from the underground rune came in handy. After dealing with that mess, I visited the closest building trader who bought a hammer and a saw. I didn't need to buy anything from him though. I was just stockpiling rusty gears for future use. Can't have too many of those now, can ya? Then I climbed the ridge and crossed it so I could visit the other building materials trader but he only bought one measly hammer. I also stopped by a luxury trader, after all I did have a golden coronet and a golden necklace to trade but she wanted neither. Next I ran to check on the treasure hunter. The treasure hunter stop only yielded one sale. Regardless, slow and steady my riches were growing. Afterwards I spent a good bit of time digging out all the ruins before making it home with a fat stack of bony soil. After depositing all the goodies at the base, I decided to check out the southeastern part of my valley. While trekking through these parts, I managed to find a survival goods trader and another luxury trader. They weren't all that useful to me considering I already had a luxury trader and a survival goods trader didn't carry anything of value to me. I hopped over a small ridge to the south and found a valley of larches and another survival goods trader. Of course, new valley meant fresh ruins, but I was more excited to get my hands on large wood. Large wood was much rarer than pine wood and with the abysmal seed drops it would be non-renewable. So I wanted to save it all for a big housing project. Unfortunately, the forest was mostly pines in the end. Here I found my first piece of resin, not that I had a lot of use for it. When I made it back to my base with a big pile of pine wood and pine seeds, I planted the seeds and visited the underground farm. Once again, I was too late to replace the torches and most fully burnt out. I really needed a full lantern set up already. Of course, that meant more panning. While panning, I was praying to the candle gods to give me more candles. However, the candle gods were straight up trolling. Besides candles, I also needed more salt peter. My previous batch got used up by the first generation of plants and now the second generation was stolen out due to depleted soil. I weighed the pros and the cons of cave diving and foolishly went down into a dark cave. Well, more like fell down with a splat, almost dying on impact. The adrenaline was coursing through my veins and I ran around in panic. It so happened that I stumbled upon a wall of saltpeter. Well, when in Rome, I suppose. Once I loaded my inventory with saltpeter, I managed to get out in one piece somehow. When I returned, I changed out my salt underwear and applied saltpeter to the soil. It was going to pay off in the long winter and the winter was coming. Next, I went back to explore the most southeastern part of my valley which ended up being a large forest with fresh runes. I made a mental note to come back later for the wood. Meanwhile, I found a ruined church, my biggest ruin to date, and excavated it for massive amounts of regular and bony soil. Of course, I immediately ran back hoping to finally score a few candles. This was the smallest stack of soil I panned this far, yet this one delivered in spades with four candles, tripling my candle supply. I also managed to a whole library of books, which I was going to keep for the decor. Next, I made four copper plates and used them to craft lanterns, which I took down to the underground farm. I spent a bit of time placing the lanterns around, opening the farm for better light coverage and harvesting the second generation of soybeans. The farm was now fully self-sustainable. There was no need to replace torches anymore. Now that the food situation was all but solved, I finally decided to start on the big housing project. After all, living under the stars during the winter was not my idea of fun. This involved sewing large quantities of wood into boards and assembling said boards into planks. The sheer volume of wood broke the saw eventually and I needed another one. I was also forced to expand my storage even further to keep my new building materials contained. After assembling the pine planks, I wanted a few chests of large planks too. So I went back to the large forest to the southeast. The forest wasn't going to be around much longer once I got there. Down here I found a commodities trader hiding sneakily inside the large trees. This was an important find. Commodities trader had some neat trades, including linen. Once my inventory was full of large, I worked up to the ridge and sprinted back home. 
At base, I processed large into boards and made large planks. At this stage, I almost had enough materials to start building. When I went down to check on the grow up, I was ambushed by a couple of drifters. Not exactly a pleasant experience and required a lot of kiting. My butthole was tight the entire time. They were clearly spawning in the cavity I dug out when mining for iron. I would address it later by blocking it off. The outdoor sun looked significantly dimmer now in late August. This was just the beginning. Permanent nights were coming and I wasn't particularly looking forward to it. Next, I visited the building materials trader and sold two more tools. I stopped by the treasure hunter but it was too early for the inventory reset. The sun kept me on my toes by constantly doing weird things. This time around, it decided to add a lot of red to the environment. After waiting for a day, I returned to the treasure hunter and managed to sell him two more tin bronze pieces. I had quite a stack of rusty gears now, but most would be reserved to buy a full black guard set. Well, if the treasure hunter would be kind enough to stock any ever. I was in a good place at this point. The food was abundant due to my grow up, I had plenty of iron and most material needs were met. What I didn't have is a place to live, mostly because I'm not half measure kind of guy. My house was going to be big and I mean really big. The idea was to build a giant ship and make it look like it got stuck in the arctic ice. So I started creating an outline of the keel underwater and then figuring out the general shape of the hull. Once the foundation layer was done, I drained it using low fertility soil. These low fertility blocks came in clutch during the building process. Low fertility soil was the fastest breaking block I owned, good for use as scaffolding. Well, where there's a layer must be another. This was my first introduction to the wrench, which was clutch for aligning textures. How does Minecraft not have this tool already? And just like that, another layer was done. After layer 3, the scale of the ship starting to hit me. Periodically, as a break from building, I would check the traders for goodies. One of the luxury traders finally wanted to buy a golden necklace. No worries, I had another one at base. Of course, I would need way more wood than I anticipated. Luckily, I had a whole pine forest for the taking in the neighboring valley. Look at all this wood in my inventory. I wasn't playing around. More wood meant more layers of my future dwelling. All fun and games until I realized how much darker it felt. Furthermore, it got back to freezing temperatures once again. The summer was officially over. Well, even more reasons to finish the house in time for the deep winter. The whole of the ship was mostly done and I was finally ready to start putting in the floor of the deck. But instead of using pine, I switched to large wood. By the time I finished the deck, I was frozen and needed to warm up by a little campfire. Not going to lie, the campfire on my wooden boat made me a little nervous. The deck was finally done though. Next, I began to smooth out the underside shape with some stairs. I definitely preferred the smoother look in the end. September 4th marked the first snow of the fall, first of many. I continued to work on the backside of the ship, figuring out the general shape. The large wood was used for contrast, to accent some of the lines, to make the ship appear a little more detailed. The back looked a bit ridiculous in isolation, but it would make more sense in context of the whole build. Unfortunately, it was almost getting too dark to reference the ship from the outside. The permanent nights were setting in. It was colder and darker, but I was determined. And thus, I started to work on the front of the ship. After extending the front and accenting the front with larch, the ship made way more sense now. It got a little lighter outside for some reason. I really did not understand the light cycle of the North Pole. It was snowing so often now that the ship's deck was fully submerged in snow. Next, I spent some time in the back, figuring out the back shape. Eventually, I would put a big glass deck there and designate it as a captain's quarters. My building efforts were interrupted by another storm. A few drifters were running away as I emerged from the shelter. It was time to check on the treasure hunter, but he refused to carry any black guard pieces. It was starting to get into really cold territory, but my underground operation was paying dividends. It was a toasty 10 degrees Celsius down here. Meanwhile, I started working on the rudder. This took me a while because I could not come up with a design that satisfied me. I finally settled on a design though and moved on to the interior design of the ship. I quickly finished the first floor of the stern and moved on to the second, which would be the captain's cabin, aka my primary residence. Of course, the interiors of the rooms needed some plowing. And soon I had two rooms at the stern completed and snow free. The bow could only fit a single floor, so that was next on the list. Right around this time, I ran out of large wood and trekked to another valley to re-up. It was probably there for a while already, but it was the first time I noticed Aurora Borealis in the sky, and it wasn't going anywhere from now on. When I reached the large valley, I decided to descend by digging straight down, and you know what they say, never dig straight down. 
you will notice a pattern of me nearly dying to falls. Complacency is a deadly killer, but so is heights. It was a miracle I survived. I was already in the right place, so it just proceeded to act as if nothing happened. If a bear took a swing at me, I would die regardless of being full, and I yet to see any surface drifters around, so I wasn't terribly worried. Maybe I should have been though, as one happened to spawn right on top of me. This was a butt clenching encounter, as I was skating on ice with very little control of my character. Luckily, the drifter lost interest in me, the only reason I didn't die. It didn't phase me one bit. Cue the clip. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. So I continued to plow through larches before making it back to the ship, pretending like nothing happened. It was starting to look pretty dope from the top of the ridge and we were just getting started. I finally had enough larch wood to finish the front and plowed the brand new room from the snow. Now it was time to move on to something exciting, working on the masts. It would finally give me the look I was after, but everything about it felt massively unsafe. These were some seriously tall masts. They were also eating through the supply of pine logs. Meanwhile, I collected another harvest from the farm. It was October already, with the temperatures being low enough that it didn't feel worth to replant anything. This would be one of my last harvests. I went ahead and removed some of the lanterns. I would need them more upstairs from now on. Upstairs, the landscape was fully covered in snow and it was permanently dark, with the aurora visible 24-7 while being extremely cold. Welcome to the Arctic. I was short on the pine logs to make masts, so I decided to take down some of the surrounding pines. I would have loved to keep them, but I felt pressure to finish the ship ASAP. It was time to build the third and the final mast. It felt kind of peaceful hanging out here in the sky, not worrying about small problems down below. Next, I put a bunch of trap doors on the deck of the ship. I feel like that is what decks look like, I don't know, I'm not a sailor. Next, it was time for the most tedious part of the build, making sails. That required a ton of snow, and I do mean a fuck ton. Snow was kind of a shitty material to work with. It required a fairly long time to break, which didn't make a ton of sense. Regardless, I set off to gather a bunch of it. It took me trying several iterations of sails before I settled on a style. Eventually, I did settle on one though. It did not look like much yet, but it would make sense in the context. To warm up from the cold weather, I would often take reprieve by my cooking pot. Next, another near-death experience when I was working on the sails. I told you, it was dangerous, but what choice did I have? Slow fall and chen was not a thing in these parts of town. I vowed to be more careful and continue to work. On top of the central mast, I was also planning to add a crow's nest. On top of the nest, I did my first bit of micro chiseling to make the snow look like a little flag on the mast. It was hard to reference the ship from the outside at this point, but I was generally happy with the sails. Following, I swung by the farm for the last time. Only a few crops remained and they were already damaged from the cold. So I grabbed them along with the rest of the lanterns and left. One more reset of a treasure hunter's inventory yielded no black guard pieces, so I got back to building. The night was a beautiful reminder of my current predicament. I was at the North Pole with no interior space to live in and a deep winter on my doorsteps. I wasn't ready to move into the house until my sales were done though, so I got back to work, which meant collecting even more snow. And of course, way more sail assembly. As I was detailing the top sail of the front mast, the sky turned blood red. It felt a little oppressive. Nonetheless, I worked through these feelings to finish the front and the middle mast, including another chisel flag on top. It was time to work on the last set of sails. I was feeling a little sick of it though. It was a long and tedious process, but the end was in sight, unlike my requirements for fresh snow. That felt endless. As I was finishing the last mast, I saw an unwelcome sight. Frozen drifters were walking through the decks of my ship. Not a pleasant development. I really could have used some armor at this point. I was not used to being worried about the drifters at all. Finally, last set of sails was done. Not that I could admire them in the darkness though. It was finally time to move into the captain's cabin, and that meant moving the chest and the materials. Everything had to be relocated from the shore into the ship's room. A bloody sky gave me enough reprieve to be able to see what I have built so far, and there was a lot more planned. Next, I finally decided to harvest the grass from the farmland. It was 
was a decent harvest. Lastly, I relocated my bed into the captain's quarters. This place was starting to feel like home. Following, I placed a few lanterns under the masts. It was dark enough to justify this move. On the inside, things were now settled, with all the chests moved, as well as other infrastructure. I had a home for once, instead of living under the stars. I wanted some glass back for the wall, so I assembled all the bloomeries I could with the fire bricks I had. Now that it was dark and cold outside, I was spending the majority of my time indoors. I kept aggressively smelting tin bronze into ingots for smithing. When the first batch of glass was done, I put a strip of glass into my wall and then immediately got into smelting tools for sale. The outside was a complete crapshoot. Luckily, most drifters were getting stuck in the little pockets of turbulent water, and the drifters on the deck were so cold they didn't seem to function at all. Since I was not getting lucky with the black guard armor, I decided to start smelting tin bronze lamella to make armor as the worst case scenario. That entailed using most of the remaining clay to form molds and fire them outside. Since I was already outside, I put more glass in, but quickly ran out. This new window configuration required lifting of the ceiling by a block, but it would make the place feel a little less claustrophobic. Unfortunately, the roof work brought in some snow from the outside. At base, I started smelting bronze lamella. To my surprise, during a routine inventory check, I finally scored my first piece of blackguard armor, which happened to be a helmet. I ran back home and started smelting necessary iron pieces for the repair. The helmet took very little iron to repair, requiring only a single iron plate and a single iron chain. And what do you know, I was a happy owner of a pristine black guard helmet. Another temporal storm passed, being stuffed into the hole. Next, I decided to put in the rest of the glass, including a third layer. I managed to score a stack of glass from one of the building materials trader. God knows, I had enough rusty gears to throw around. The third layer of glass forced me to lift the roof one more time. Once I was finished with the roof, I dedicated a long session to smithing enough iron for the other two pieces of blackguard armor. I quickly ran out of blooms though, and that meant a quick run to the iron shelf. Luckily, there was still no shortage of iron to go around. At base, I had enough fire clay bricks for three more bloomeries full of iron. And then, I proceeded to smith, and smith, and smith, until it was time to check the traders. To my elation, the treasure hunter sold Blackguard pants, which I promptly bought. Two thirds of Blackguard set was now mine. I was much closer than anticipated to be at this point, which meant breaking the bloomeries and smithing, and smithing, and smithing some more. Soon, I had fully repaired black guard pants, but I didn't stop there. I kept on smithing in anticipation of a chest. God, did I wish I had a health hammer for this. But unfortunately, a health hammer was still just a pipe dream at this point. So I grit my teeth and continued working. Once the black guard stuff was out of the way, I also crafted an iron shield. I wanted a full defensive set. I did end up running out of iron for tools and had to make another run. Then I fired up two more bloomeries. This would be the last batch of this playthrough though. It will last me until the end. Following, I spent a little time crafting more tin bronze tools for sale. Next, I had a big micro chiseling project in mind. I wanted to make something that looked like ropes strong across the ship. This is a type of micro chiseling project that makes me want a chisel block replicator of some sort. Making all of these simple pieces by hand was not my idea of fun. But this was a vanilla playthrough, so by hand it was. Next came the task of putting these pieces together, as if it was a rope strung from a mast. Eventually, I made the rope touch the nose of the ship. After, I checked the traders to sell some more tools. I was down to 29 gears, and that was a little short of 35 gears that a black guard chest could potentially cost. On the way back, I looked at the ship, but it was way too dark to see the finer details I was putting in. I was hoping that my ideas would work in the end though. There was one more task that I wanted to accomplish and that required more snow. A lot of the water refused to ice over and I wanted a trapped in the ice type of look for the ship. So I started closing the patches of turbulent water. Next, I visited the treasure hunter but it was too early for the reset. I didn't feel like running back, so I decided to wait in a 1x2 hole. It is considered an enclosed space so it stays relatively warm. Fun fact, one day left on the inventory reset can actually mean one day and 23 hours, which is what I think happened to me because I kept waiting and waiting, checking and checking, and no reset occurred. Eventually, I ran out of food and had to run back. At base, I cooked more meals, worked a little bit on the ship, and then ran back to check on the trader one more time. My efforts paid off. The trader carried a blackguard chest, the last piece. 
Of course, I already had everything I needed to repair, so before long, I had a full set of Black Guard armor, an Iron Shield, and a Black Guard sword. I had the best gear I could possibly acquire. A Temporal Storm hit, so I went hiding, before realizing I had the gear to face the day. So I came out and slugged it out with some drifters. I was definitely beat up at the end, but I was victorious. After the storm, I made another batch of diagonal rope and placed it on the mast. With a lantern sitting on the nose of the ship, you could kinda see what I was going for. Now, I needed horizontal rope. Did I mention micro chiseling can get pretty tedious? I was also aggressively sleeping every opportunity I had. I wanted to skip as much of this deep winter as I could. Food was still not an issue. Once I had enough horizontal pieces, I would string them along on the masts. Two sets of rope on every mast. The darkness and the drifters were becoming a little oppressive. Majority of my time was spent micro chiseling, placing the blocks, and of course sleeping, trying to blast through the winter ASAP. Once the rope props were done, I decided to make an access to the hole below Captain's cabin. So I built some stairs leading down. Here I punched holes on both sides of the ship to make port holes. Then I decided to show the local drifters who was boss. They were annoying the absolute crap out of me at this point. While outside, I referenced my ship and was happy. It did require a bit more detailing though. So I slapped a few trapdoors on the port holes, placed a couple more windows in the back, and then begun micro chiseling the steering wheel. I went through several iterations of the wheel before settling on the one I liked. The detailing of the ship continued. I micro chiseled a lantern holder for the back of the ship, one on each side. Next, I built a ladder up to the crow's nest on the main mast. Here, I stopped to smell the roses. In this case, it meant enjoying the aurora in the sky until someone flipped the switch. I still did not understand the light phenomena in the North Pole. Next, I started smoothing out the back of the ship with some stairs. Between building and sleeping, I managed to skip all the way to March 1st. It was significantly less dark outside now, to the point that I could see my creation fully and it was glorious. It looked so much cooler than whatever that thing was I built in my first 100 days video. During a typical trader run that I kept up religiously, one of the luxury traders ended up having a resonator. It was super expensive, but I could not pass on that opportunity. The other luxury trader offered to buy my golden coronet, and since I was now broke due to the resonator purchase, I was willing to part with that. I immediately reinvested these gears into linen sheets. I wanted to make a windmill, even if it would be just a token windmill plugged into nothing. That meant I would need to stop by a mark pine tree with the resin. Once I made it back home, I realized I was now a proud owner of a resonator, but with no tuning cylinders. Something I would attempt to fix. However, before that, I laid a foundation for the windmill. I had a lot of cobblestone from the ruins, so it made sense to use it for the build. For some reason, this playthrough was inviting a lot of tall builds. Tall builds it was. So I continued climbing with the cobblestone to some undetermined height. However, I miscalculated the amounts of cobblestone needed, so I ended up doing a little redesign, including using wood for the top portion of the build. Next, I crafted a rotor and slapped full set of sails on it. Only possible because commodities trader sold me so much linen. And by the time all was said and done, it looked just alright. Clearly needed a few more details. So I continued working on it, trying to make it look a little more spicy. Next, it was time to make a few more tin bronze tools to sell. I still needed glass, fire clay bricks, and I was always on the lookout for something cool, like this teal tapestry that I slapped on my ship. Unfortunately, both building material traders refused to sell me glass or fire clay bricks. I checked my inventory and cobbled together a single bloomery, which I loaded with quartz. Better than nothing. It was already end of March, and there was one thing that bothered me. I had a resonator, but no records. So I found the deepest cave I could and dove right in. This time around, the fall wasn't nearly as scary, and I was prepared for whatever inhabited these caves. Well, at least that is what I thought. A locust nest proved to be a big problem. So much so that I nearly died trying to break the nest. I narrowly escaped with my life and stuffed myself into a hole, where I used a couple of poultices. The only ones I had left. Well, I wasn't worried about dying at this point. I achieved most of the things I wanted, so I pressed on forward. I doubled back and killed the rest of the locusts. Eventually, I descended all the way down to the mantle, and not wanting to climb all the way up, I started digging in a random direction, hoping to hit another cave nearby. It didn't take me too long to hit another cave system covered in saltpeter. 
And what do you know, I found an underground rune in my first translocator of the game. This might have been useful earlier. I grabbed every crate and every piece of random junk to use as decorations for my ship. In the last chest, to my surprise, was a tuning cylinder, a song named Hallowcraft. I didn't want to risk not being able to play the record at least once, so I dug directly up from the ruins and popped right behind my house. I slowly walked towards the ship, enjoying the sight of my labor. I slapped a painting in the captain's cabin on the wall, as well as using various crates and props from the ruins to give the ship even more detail. Then I went back into the captain's cabin to enjoy my new tune. It was a weird one for sure. Since I tend to record Vintage Story, I have yet to listen to any of the music, so this was a fun introduction. I even jammed out a bit. April 1st, one month to go. I continued working on the windmill. I used aged wood to extend the top, and then I cut a double slit window on the front and put one bloomery worth of glass in. It made it look a lot more interesting, no doubt. Next, I micro chiseled some antenna looking thing on top and put another bloomery worth of glass in. That is all I could do at the moment one bloomery at a time. Finally, I wanted to try just a couple of more things. One was to fight a bear, one on one, in melee for once. So I climbed a ridge and tried this exact premise. Something about bear AI was super funky though. They would constantly run away and were impossible to hit, unless they got stuck of course. Then I decided to fight a temporal storm head on. Unfortunately, a double-headed drifter almost immediately ended that idea. I stuffed myself into a hole to wait out the rest of the storm. I did a few more things to the windmill and was finally satisfied with the result. A building material trader finally decided to have fire clay bricks. I have not seen this trade in like 6 months. Which proves that getting them as early as I did was extremely lucky. So I got some more quartz, fired up a couple more bloomeries and used the glass to finish the windows of the windmill. Next, I came out and decided to test a rift. I stood in one until my stability dropped to zero, but no drifters came. I guess they can't spawn during the day no matter what. Dave did come out to say hi though. Finally, I went back to dance one more time. After dancing to exhaustion, I went outside to admire my creations and was generally happy with what I saw. Definitely an improvement over my last housing project in the previous video. And then I climbed to the crow's nest to meet May 1st, aka a 100 day mark. Oops, I did it again. Another 100 days in the books. This was a tough challenge, no doubt. It required a lot of learning and a lot of practice to pull off. It was fun though. I love learning the ins and outs of this game. Remember, masters don't get bored. If you're still here, I love you. Don't forget to do all that YouTube stuff. I hope you enjoyed this video through and through. There will certainly be way more vintage story content and otherwise, as long as you keep watching. If you have an idea for a challenge or a video though, please let me know in the comments. I wish everyone an amazing 2024 and on that note, Oscilloscape is beaming out.